Chapter 4, August The heavy fighting around Soissons in July 1918 shocked Brailsford Junction out of its complacency. As the casualty list grew and personal tragedy came to one home after another, we seemed much nearer to the trenches and the shell-shattered wheat fields of France, red with poppies and with blood. One of the first reactions of the saddened town was to forbid the war games we had been playing each Saturday on Earl's Hill. It seemed a shame after all our work constructing dugouts and opposing trench systems, for we had thoroughly enjoyed our desperate battles. The only participant to protest loudly was Slammy Stillman, the overgrown town bully who never had played fair. He was the only boy who threw stones instead of the regulation clods of earth, and the only one who sometimes aimed at our Red Cross nurses, who were identified by the dish towel each girl draped over her head. The ceremony that really drove home the grim fact that war is not a game was the service held in memory of Raleigh Adams one of the most admired boys in town. Neighbors of all faiths came to the Methodist church to hear Reverend Hooten remind us that Raleigh had never hurt or hated anyone. The big service flag had been taken down and placed across the lap of Raleigh's mother. Her part of the ceremony was to remove a service star and to sew on the gold one. Everyone wept and the war seemed terribly near. I found myself praying silently that Herschel's star would not be changed to gold. We wouldn't even have Mother here to sew it on. There was a flurry of patriotism among the children of the town, the girls knitting khaki wristlets by the score, and the boys competing to see who could collect the most peach pits used in making charcoal for gas masks. Another lively contest was a scramble for tinfoil. Up and down the streets and alleys went the tinfoil hunters, each child for himself, but I had a helper. As soon as Rascal dimly perceived the general idea, he ranged ahead of me searching the gutters for the shining foil. My ball of foil was one of the largest, thanks to an occasional contribution made by my raccoon. Rascal's only other assistance in the war effort was the help he gave me in the garden. While I hoed, he trundled along behind me like a little dog. He also helped me pick peas from a late planting. All of the peas he picked, however, he kept for himself, opening each pod as though it were a small clam and avidly shelling the green pearls into his mouth. He had little relish for the wax beans, which were coming on by the bushel. So while I picked beans, he often took a comfortable siesta in the shade of the rhubarb leaves. It was pleasant out there in my garden, warm by the sun, cooled by an occasional breeze. The wax beans were gold and smooth, with the texture of satin, and they hung in such thick clusters beneath their leaves that it did not take long to fill a basket. Although the grocery stores paid me well for my vegetables, it was reward enough just to plant and harvest such a garden. My mother had told me that seeds carry, in their memory, the whole complex pattern of stem and leaf and flower and fruit, and she had shown me how the stamens and pistils begin the seed-making process all over again. It seemed mir miraculous then, and no less miraculous now. I had been noticing that my little raccoon also carried patterns in his brain, as do the migrating birds and the honey-storing bees. I think I learned more about the orderly universe sitting in my garden picking beans than I ever did on a hard church pew listening to Reverend Hooten's sermons. One serious mistake I made, however, 
was to give Rascal his first taste of sweet corn. I twisted a plump ear from a stalk in one of my rows, stripped back the husk, and handed the corn to my pet, who had carefully watched the whole performance. Rascal went slightly berserk. No other food he had ever tasted compared to this juicy new delicacy which he was sampling for the first time. He ate most of the first ear, then in a frenzy scrambled up another corn stalk, pulling it slowly to the ground. He wrestled and struggled with the fresh ear, tearing away part of the husk and guzzling greedily as before. Still unsatisfied, he left the second ear half eaten to climb a third corn stalk. He was drunk and disorderly on the nectar and ambrosia called sweet corn. I thought Rascal's binge was amusing, but when I told the story to my father, he looked at us both quite seriously and said, I'm afraid you're in for trouble, Sterling. I certainly was in for trouble. Rascal spent less than half the ensuing night in our bed, which didn't disturb me too greatly, since sleeping with a raccoon in August is a little too warm for comfort. I was aware that he must have let himself out and gone on a neighborhood prowl, but this was not unusual. On subsequent nights, he took similar French leave, and he began sleeping soundly through most of the daylight hours. I didn't connect his nocturnal ramblings with his love for sweet corn, principally because he avoided our corn patch. The explanation was simple. To keep my woodchucks out of the garden, we had surrounded it with a woven wire fence and installed a gate with a strong latch. Rascal could have climbed that fence, but found it more convenient to raid the garden of our neighbors. August is an intemperate month in any case when emotions go up with the thermometer. But the angry voices to be heard on our street each morning were sizzling, even for August. One neighbor after another, easy-going, salty Mike Conway, handsome, slight vein Walter Dabbitt, the skinflint lumber dealer, Cy Jenkins, and the terrible-tempered Reverend Thurman found their respective sweet corn patches mauled by some fiendish night raider. Plans for detection and revenge were underway. It was C.Y. Jenkins who found raccoon tracks in the dust between his corn rows and spread the news. My father was right. I was facing real trouble. A delegation arrived one evening to sit in a circle around my unfinished canoe, voicing their complaints while Rascal huddled in my lap for protection. I seen that varmint's tracks right in my garden, Jenkins said triumphantly. Like the seven plagues of Egypt, Thurman sermonized. Now, Sterling, we like your little raccoon, Mrs. Dabbitt began. But the next time he gets in my sweet corn, her husband warned. The threats came whizzing around us like a buzz of angry hornets. Next moonlight night, next moonlight night, I'll shoot him. I'll set a trap, so help me. Skunks, woodchucks, coons, what's next? Now just a moment, my father said quietly. Among other civic responsibilities, he served as justice of the peace and knew from long experience how to handle a group of angry people. Mike Conway was willing to listen. What do you suggest? If Sterling buys a collar and a leash for his raccoon. Not enough, sighed Jenkins growled. And Anne builds him a cage, my father added. Rascal began to whimper, and I looked anxiously from face to face. Most were grim, but Mrs. Davitt gave me a sympathetic glance before turning to glare at her husband. Reverend Thurman belonging to a sect which will here remain nameless, glowered at my, father, at my father and thundered, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. 
Thurman had been under his Model T all day, using pulpit words, but not in the Sunday manner. Something about his inappropriate quotation from Holy Writ struck Mike Conway as funny. Mike had a lusty and infectious laugh. And when he threw back his head and roared, everyone except Thurman joined in the chorus. Well, it's settled then, my father said. Sterling, why don't you bring some glasses and a pitcher of cold grape juice? Thurman and Jenkins didn't stay for the refreshments, but the rest of us enjoyed the cool drink, Rascal taking his from a saucer. I'm sorry, Mrs. Dabbitt said to me as she was leaving. Rascal didn't know he was doing wrong. After the neighbors were gone, I said bitterly to my father, You can put criminals in jail, but you can't put my good little raccoon in jail. How would you like to be led around on a leash? Now, Sterling, my father said soothingly, it's better than having Rascal shot or trapped. Well, all right but I think Rascal and I will run away and live in a cabin in the woods somewhere. In the woods? As far from people as we can get, way up in the north woods on the shore of Lake Superior, maybe. My father pondered this for a moment and then said, How would you like to take a two-week trip all the way to Superior? Bring Rascal along, of course. Ah, oh, do you really mean it? Of course I mean it. You can ask the Conway boys to feed Wowser and take care of your war garden. I snatched Rascal from the rug and started dancing crazily, which didn't disturb my raccoon. He was always ready for a romp. We had been given a, repr a reprieve, a wonderful two-week reprieve. When can we start, Daddy? By tomorrow, I suppose, my father said. I'll just put a sign on the office door. There were no superhighways in those days. To streak impersonally towards some distant goal, scoring the countryside with ribbons of unfeeling concrete. In fact, there was scant paving of any kind. Only friendly little roads that wandered everywhere, muddy in wet weather, dusty and dry, but clinging to ancient game and Indian trails skirting orchards where one might reach out to pluck an early apple, winding through the valleys of streams and rivers, coming so close to flower gardens and pastures of clover that no one could smell, that one could smell all the good country smells, from new-mown hay to ripening corn. We started early the next morning, my father, Rascal, and I, in our usual places on the front seat. Turning northward toward Fort Atkinson, we passed our old farm and the Coomlean place as we ascended to the Rock River Valley. Finding the sources of streams was a passion of my, with me. Was a passion with me. I had followed Saunders Creek all the way to its first spring, nearly ten miles north of Brailsford Junction and I had always wanted to follow the Rock River to its source. So we went by way of the Horicon Marshes, as romantic to me as Sidney Lanier's Marshes of Glynn. At some point in this neighborhood, we crossed the divide between water pouring down the Rock River to the Mississippi and waters pouring into Lake Winnebago and the Fox River to Lake Michigan and thus down the lakes to the St. Lawrence and the Atlantic. When we saw the first creek running northeastward, I felt like the early French explorers of this region. We skirted Lake Winnebago for many miles, from Fond du Lac to Nina and Menasha, where Winnebago empties into the Fox, there to cascade in several major rapids on its winding journey to Green Bay. We were making excellent time, considering the bumpy roads and two blowouts, which in those days one took with serenity. Struggling with tire irons, inner tubes, 
likely to be pinched, and hand pumps to inflate the tires. We had packed some of my casual sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs, fresh peaches, and a dozen donuts. There was no reason to bring any special food for Rascal. He ate almost anything, just as though he were a person, which he definitely believed he was. We bought a tin pail of fresh, cold milk at a farmhouse that feasted and feasted beside the bridge over a rushing stream. When Rascal had eaten, he curled up on the cushion of the big black seat, a coil of shining fur against the maroon leather, and there he slept happily all afternoon. It's even more exciting to move from one boreal region to another than to move from watershed to watershed. This second divide we were crossing was from the deciduous trees of southern Wisconsin, the elms, maples, oaks, and hickories, into the evergreen region of pines, spruce, hemlock, and cedars. Now the farm odors and fragrances blended into the great perfume of the north woods, the sharp, spicy aroma of the firs, and the fine, hot scent of the pine needles lying four inches thick to blanket the forest floor. We began to see the first granite and basalt rock formations of the oldest geologic period of the world. The Canadian shield, which carries in it its treasure house some of the richest ores on the continent, iron, copper, silver, and many other minerals. My father knew enough geology and mineralogy to show me where the salts of copper had stained a cliff blue with azurite and green with malachite. These colors blended with assurance into the moss and lichen on the rocks, adding their tints to those of sky and water. I felt a twinge of conscience to be so carried away with this new and different beauty of northern Wisconsin. It was as though I was being unfaithful to southern Wisconsin and to my own lake, Koshkonnog. In those days, there were no motels and few other places to sleep along the highway, unless in a tent or under the open sky. I wanted to be a voyager on this excursion, sleeping without cover. My father was willing to gamble against Rang, being as little concerned as I. We stopped on a point which extended into a small clear lake, unpacked such duffel as we needed, and arranged our camp. Safely out on an extremity of bare granite, its crystals possibly two billion years old, we built a modest fire to cook our evening meal. I went to the bottom of the cliff with rod and reel to cast a wet fly toward an inviting expanse of ivory white water lilies. On my fifth cast, an eager black bass, two and one half pounds perhaps, seized the lure and tangled himself in the lilies. I brought him out at last, eyes lustrous, scales shining. Cleaned, filleted, and fried golden brown, he made an appetizing fish course for three hungry campers there among the pines. We had no tent, only navy hammocks. Still trusting this bright, clear August weather, fringed everywhere with goldenrod and asters, we consigned ourselves to the canopy of the sky. That first night, we tied one end of each hammock to spruce trees, and the other to the rear bumper of the Oldsmobile. We had our easily imaginable difficulties climbing aboard these tipsy platforms of canvas, while also pulling the blankets around us. My father said he would show me how it was done. Firmly grasping the dowel pin, which spread the upper end of the canvas, he eased himself into his treacherous bed. But before he could cover himself with a blanket, the hammock flipped upside down. He landed unhurt, but exasperated on the thick padding of spruce and pine needles. I laughed until I was breathless, 
and Rascal hurried over to see why my father was lying on the ground muttering to himself. I'll bet it's easy, I said confidently. I made a running dive, lit squarely in the hammock, held it for a minute, and then did a somersault. Now my father was laughing as hard as I was, and Rascal was scampering around as though he understood the joke. Just then, at the most appropriate moment, something else began to laugh. Manacle, spine-chilling laughter from far across the lake. Holy Moses, what's that? That's a loon, my father said, and he's laughing at us. He thinks we're crazy trying to sleep in Navy hammocks. I was suddenly completely happy, in love with the loony world and with my father and rascal. I didn't care where I slept or how many times I tipped out of my hammock. The new moon came up, a sliver of silver through the pointed firs on the far edge of the lake, and the fragrance of balsam and pine swept over the darkening point. We learned at last how to sleep in a hammock and still cover ourselves with blankets. Soon we dropped into blissful slumber with Rascal beside me. Little screech owls sang our lullaby, and at the base of the cliff there was a gentle swish-swish of small waves, the most soothing sound in the world. It was shortly after midnight that the brakes began to slip. The first warning came when we bumped the ground gently in our collapsing hammocks. The car was backing slowly toward us. My father, thinking fast, threw a stone under a rear wheel. Rascal awoke more swiftly than I did and went prowling around the car as though he thought we were being attacked. My father and I were so sleepy that we merely removed the more obvious sticks and stones, rearranged the pine needles under our hammocks, and went back to sleep again. That was the way we would fix our beds from this night on, flat on the ground, the only way you can possibly sleep in a hammock. After a few growls and whimpers and trills, Rascal came back to crawl in with me under my warm blankets. The cool night went on without us, oblivious of this small intrusion of humanity, and the gentle serenade continued. A night heron's distant croak, the, foot, the footfall of a fox, fish splashing in the pale moonlight. The, si the sidereal universe went wheeling around us, pivoted on the North Star, which as a very small child I thought was named for us when Mother first had shown me the Great Dipper and the star toward which it points. We awoke at dawn, wonderfully refreshed by a night in the pine-scented air. My father said he felt a little stiff, but I challenged him to join us for a swim in the icy lake. We, we dipped, towel dry, and raced up the path to the cliff, panting and laughing, with Rascal dripping gaily along behind. For breakfast, we had bacon sandwiches and the remaining peaches, with black coffee from a graniteware pot. As we sat munching our sandwiches, utterly contented, a very large bird came soaring over the lake. I spotted him first. Look, a bald eagle. My father watched the bird for several moments before he said, No, son, but you were close. It's an osprey. How can you tell? An eagle soars on straight pinions. The osprey has a slight bend in its wings. Our bird is only crested with white. The mature bald eagle has a head which is entirely white. Obviously, there was much I still could learn from my father, who explained complicated matters so simply. Rascal was begging for the last of my sandwich, standing on his capable hind legs, patting my cheek, and reaching for the food. 
So I lay on the ground at his level. We looked each other squarely in the eyes as we nibbled at either end of the bacon sandwich. Growling softly just for the joy of pretending we were fighting a little over the food we were sharing. Soon we were packed and off into the morning through pine shadows and patches of sunlight, which dappled a winding road through the forest. One of the several poems, which I knew by heart at this age, was Keats on first looking into Chapman's Homer. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies, when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez with his eagle eyes, he stared at the Pacific and all his men, looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. My sister Jessica, the poet of our family, had told me that it was probably Balboa, and certainly not Cortez, who had caught this particular glimpse of the Pacific. Her criticism did not lessen my admiration for the sonnet. I was still in that uncritical stage which allows for the enjoyment of poetry. We came upon Lake Superior with similar astonishment and wild surmise. An entire ocean stretching far beyond the horizon, as though a sapphire half as big as the visible sky had been set among granite cliffs and northern pines. This sea of sweet water, as Radisson had called it, when he had visited these shores in the autumn of 1659, is the largest and deepest of the Great Lakes. No cleaner, colder, or more crystal water will be found upon our continent. It is rightly named superior, having no equal in the world. From our eminence above Chequamingong Bay, we could see several of the Apostle Islands blending into the far distance. As we hurried toward the lake, I found myself reluctantly admitting that this tremendous bowl of blue water was indeed more beautiful than my Koshkanong. On a shore of sparkling sand and clean washed gravel, with the gulls crying overhead, my father and rascal and I walked the, walked the beach, like beachcombers in a dream. This might have been Crusoe's island. We were so alone with sea and sky. In a little pool made by an entering rivulet, my raccoon caught a gleaming minnow which proved to be a trout, dappled with color. Rascal next explored the whitening stumps, washed up by the waves. Though these labyrinths he felt, through these labyrinths he felt his way, curious but cautious, apparently expecting to meet the rightful owner at any moment. The beaches of Lake Superior are strewn with agates. These ancient jewels are the result of age-long water seepage into small cavities in the rock. The water carries silica in solution, stained by various minerals. The result is often a gem which is cross-sectioned, shows rings within rings of crocus yellow through all the shades of brown to deep rich red. On the outside agates are often pitted and with no visible evidence of their interior beauty, which rivals the most suitable stained glass. If by accident broken open, however, they shine, wet and radiant upon the beach. During that morning, we found more than 20 stones worthy of cutting and polishing. Rascal knew nothing about agates, picking up and dropping almost any bright stone that took his eye. But he did find one of the broken agates, and I kept it for him, to add to his pennies and his arrowhead. In time, he grew impatient with this beach which seemed to have no crayfish, and went to sleep in the hollow of an old stump until we, we also tired of the agate hunt. We ate at a small restaurant in Ashland, then followed the road westward, which brought us 
into the valley of the Brule River, the finest trout stream in Wisconsin. Needing supplies, we stopped in an old, unpainted crossroad store. There was everything imaginable for sale in that store. Snowshoes, shotguns and deer rifles, and even a yoke for oxen. You could buy groceries as well as brightly colored yard goods. Snow packs and bear traps. There was also merchandise more fascinating to me, such as an excellent split bamboo fly rod and hand-tied trout flies, which I viewed with longing. While my father bought bread, bacon, and other necessities, Rascal and I browsed. I had been taught never to touch things when I shopped, but Rascal had no such scruples. He delicately fingered everything shiny at his level, never cutting himself or tipping over the object. His little hands examined gleaming axes, TV hooks, and entrancing fly reels. On and on went his happy investigation of log chains, garden tools, and other hardware. Only when he climbed on a counter and started touching the kerosene lamps did I stop him for fear he might send one crashing to the floor. Real smart coon you got there, the storekeeper said. Make a good coonskin cap someday. He'll never be a coonskin cap, I said fiercely. Here we got an illustration for you to take a look at. Surprised at the anger in my voice, nobody will ever skin rascal. We came at last to what was to be our permanent camp in the North Woods. It was on a promontory some 20 feet above one of the deepest and most beautiful trout pools I'd ever seen, carved from the rock at a curve in the brule. The grove shading the little hill was the only piece of virgin timber we found in all that North Country. If the trees had been white pine, they would have been cut 40 years previously, but they were yellow pine, just as proud in the forest, but almost useless to the carpenter, who calls this intractable wood devil pine, because it cracks and splinters in every direction and refuses to take a nail without a tantrum. The nearest branches were at least 35 feet above us, and the forest floor beneath had no vegetation, only a thick carpet of pine needles. The breeze was always gently stirring in the high canopied room, and again we had a projecting rock above the river for safe campfires. When the sun sank slowly westward through our pine roof mansion, we ate and prepared our beds upon the ground. I had almost decided that I would live here forever, thus avoiding permanently the nightmare of caging my pet raccoon. It was characteristic of my parent that he had not told me the real reason for this trip. He had, he had been asked to testify as an expert witness in a case being tried before a judge in Superior, Wisconsin. Our camp on the Brule was some 20 miles from the courtroom, so each day the court was in session, my father would leave shortly after breakfast, taking his packet of notes and documents, and would return during the afternoon. I had no interest in legal affairs, and my father was tranquil concerning my safety. He knew that I could scarcely get lost if I stayed on the river or one of its branches, and that Rascal and I could swim if we fell into one of the deeper pools. Several recent showers lessened the danger of forest fires, and we had seen no signs of bear, neither footprints along the stream nor trees scratched or rubbed at the bear's length above the ground. Despite the war in Europe, the world as a whole seemed safe in those days. We had left our house unlocked in Brailsford Junction. We seldom took the key from the car, 
We trust that our fellow human beings, and particularly the creatures of the woods. Two weeks of absolute freedom. Each hour was savored. The very first day, Rascal and I found an opening in the forest where a sunny hillside was festooned with blueberries, nearly as large and dark as grapes, their leaves lacquered deep red. We hurried back to camp for a bucket and returned to pick three or four quarts of such delicious fruit that I ate a third as many as I put in the pail. Rascal had an even better record. He ate every blueberry he picked. That afternoon, we were too busy exploring to find time to fish, wearing only swimming trunks. I padded over pine needles as alluring to my bare feet as to rascals. We crossed some tributaries to the Brule, or waded up their winding shallows, hoping to find the hidden springs from which they emerged. We walked the length of mossy logs, crossed and recrossed the Brule in its foaming riffles, ice cold and amber clear. Once I slipped on a submerged boulder and went laughing down into the pool below, with Rascal plunging in dutifully to follow me in my fun. Little red pine squirrels scolded us as though we had interrupted a service in a cathedral. Striped chipmunks came darting out, whistling and chirping, frantic with curiosity and eager to see the show. We had wandered far up the stream, and now the sun told us we should be getting back to camp. A pleasant breeze was tempering the August heat as we retrace our paths, sometimes in and sometimes out of the water. Rascal fished the river's edge, feasting on minnows. I was seeing enough big trout where the sun struck deep in the pools to know that here was a stream to rival Isaac Walton's River Dove. When we arrived at camp, we were astonished to find a robber in the process of gnawing his way into the wooden box which contained our salt, flour, and other dry groceries. I had never before seen a porcupine, although my father had told me about them, and this could be none other than that very animal, clumsy, pug-nosed, and bristled with quills. Porcupines can't throw their quills. These barbed har harpoons, however, leave the original owner at a touch, but stay in the flesh of his enemies like little fish hooks. Rascal had raced ahead for a closer look, but suddenly grew cautious. All of his ancestors seemed to be whispering in his ear, Careful, it's a porcupine. I didn't want to kill the intruder. Using a long stick, I nudged him gently toward a small tree, up which he scrambled until he looked like a hawk's nest in the highest crotch. Then I went to examine the damage to our stores. It was our salt he had craved. He had ripped the salt box wide open and eaten enough to make him thirsty for the next six months. He wouldn't stay up that tree very long, I concluded. He would have to come down and go to the river for a drink. Rascal and I lay on our backs, drinking cold pop from a case we kept in the nearby spring. I'll bet he wishes he had a bottle of pop, I said to Rascal, as we gazed up at the thirsty porcupine. But Rascal was too busy to pay much attention. Holding his bottle with both hands and both feet, he drank as fast as a little raccoon can. He had no intimation that this free life would not go on forever, or that he would soon be headed homeward to captivity. One loses sense of time in the woods. I had no watch to replace my broken Ingersoll, and could only guess at the hour of the day by looking at the sun. I had even forgotten what day it was, and it certainly didn't matter. 
No school bell or church bell rang to remind us of the dutiful passage of time. One day blended into the next and could be remembered as the day we saw the porcupine or the day we found Lost Lake. It may have been the second or third day that Rascal and I followed one of the larger upstream branches of the Brule far into the woods in search of its source. I had brought my fish pole, a can of worms, and a creel, but I wasn't having much luck with trout. Only two eight inchers, which I unhooked carefully and returned unharmed to the stream. Brook trout are almost too beautiful to keep, being in these waters dark above with rosettes of filtered sunlight along their sides. Some as red as winter green berries and some almost golden. They are amber pale beneath, part of the water itself and of the spirit of the woods. As usual, the pine squirrel scolded, and once a ruffled grouse burst from cover with an explosion of wing music, burrowing off through the slanting sunlight in the forest. Rascal turned to me for protection and asked his usual questions. I assured him there was no danger and laughed at him for being afraid of a grouse. Somewhere in the neighborhood, there were grouse chicks hiding, all but invisible in the pine needles and old leaves. I didn't want Rascal to find them, so I told him to come along. On we went, up and up, that rushing woodland stream. It seemed a miracle that anything as young as fingerling trout or grouse chicks or my small raccoon could move along this water course among boulders as old as the world. The new life of this very season, amid granite predating even the first life on the globe. My mother, before she died, had revealed a few simple facts about the earliest forms of life on earth and had tried to explain the story of creation in the Bible as a means by which a primitive and poetic people sought to record the beginnings of things. This does not mean that there is no God, she said, or that he didn't create heaven and earth, darkness and light, and the seas and the land. Yes, and millions of suns and planets, whole galaxies of distant stars. His spirit does move upon the face of the waters. Then patiently, like the very good teacher she was, my mother explain, had explained in words I could understand how the plants and animals had evolved from the simpler forms of life to the wonderfully complex flora and fauna of our present era. And I had thought there was no more gracious or knowing than my mother, and nothing more pleasant than the sound of her voice. She seemed very close to me now, as Rascal and I made our way up this branch of the Brule. The stream came winding toward us, over and under mossy logs. It tumbled through the remains of, abandoned beaver, of an abandoned beaver dam, and ran like quicksilver across the beaver meadow, where meadow larks added their music to that of the water. Then, half a mile farther upstream, we came upon it suddenly. A little lake, which was the very source, as round as a big drop of dew and as clear. Its shores were of clean sand and gravel, and it was cupped among low hills, forested with evergreens, with several white birches standing in sharp relief against this background of dark firs. There were water lilies in the shadows, their floating pads large enough for little frogs to sit on, and blossoms the size of saucers where green and scarlet dragonflies held court. We had come so quietly over the pine needles that the bathers had not seen us, and they were withers deep in the lake, the first white-tailed doe and the first fawn I had ever gazed upon, except in nature books. Then Rascal saw them, and was smitten by one of his crazy ideas. He slipped into the water and took the shortest route toward the deer, creating no more disturbance than an otter, 
and causing the doe and fawn no concern. The fawn and little raccoon had almost touched noses when the doe sensed me, blew a note of warning to her fawn, and lunged from the lake, calling to her offspring to follow. For a moment she hesitated and looked back toward me with great liquid eyes. Then Doe and Fawn went bounding off through the willows, throwing their white flags into the sunlight. Rascal came paddling back, very pleased with himself, thinking he had performed a brave service by frightening these intruders from a lake, which now is ours by right of discovery and conquest. On another day, Rascal and I turned downstream on a fishing expedition. Because I did not own a fly rod, and had never had an opportunity to master the difficult and delicate art of manipulating a dry fly, I substituted the next best lure, a wet fly, which I cast as one does a bass plug, retrieving this streamer in short jerks as though it were a wounded minnow. In a likely pool half a mile downstream, I felt a powerful lunge as a hungry trout struck the old bucktail. But the fish had missed the hook and refused to strike again. More than ever, I yearned for a fly rod and an assortment of dry flies to fish these trout as they should be fished. Rascal was having better luck than I. He examined the river's edge with contemplative fingers, turning over small rocks in search of crayfish. The past and future meant nothing to Rascal. He lived completely in the present without ambition or worry. A very comfortable fishing companion. Beyond a bend in the river, we came upon the first human habitation I had seen in days. I experienced a shock of recognition that was almost uncanny, as though I had lived here in a previous life. And yet I had never seen anything exactly like this big cabin with its huge stone fireplace, rambling veranda, and green lawn sloping to the water. If Rascal and I were determined to live in the woods, here was the home we wanted. I realized, sadly, however, that wishing won't make it so. This cabin must belong to someone, and a fairly wealthy owner at that. As we came around a clump of willows, there he was, fishing his own trout pool with a split bamboo fly rod, which he handled as gracefully as an orchestra conductor handles his baton. He was a tall, sp spare man, brown by the sun and quietly intent upon his fishing. His old felled hat was decorated with trout flies. He was smoking a pipe and, sing and seemed completely at peace with the world. I held Rascal in my arms so that he would not interrupt the performance, and we watched for several minutes unnoticed by the fisherman. It's fascinating to watch a good fly caster, and this man was an expert. It seemed almost impossible that with his wand of split bamboo, he could direct a weightless lure with such precision that he could drop it on the water 50 feet downstream within inches of any target. The fly lighted upon the pool as gently as though it were indeed a living insect. On each back cast, he lifted the lure and line high behind him, then with split-second timing brought forward the tip of the rod, sending the fly swiftly downstream to its destination. On each forward cast, he stripped extra line from the reel until his fly was reaching the edge of, the, of a boulder at the foot of the pool, a good 60 feet below the gravel bar on which he was standing. Then it happened, just as the fisherman had planned. There was a heavy swirl as the trout left his haven below the boulder, a tremendous surge, then a leap clear of the water. I suppose we should have been cheering for that fish, making such a gallant fight for his life. But Rascal and I were primitive, as eager as the flycaster to bring the big trout to net. 
We ran down the path to the gravel bar to be near the scene of action as the tall, calm fisherman patiently played the fish. That rod bent like a bow during the lunges, easing to a gentle arc as the trout ran upstream. Although busy with his fish, the angler looked up and smiled when he saw his visitors. But I knew enough not to talk at such a moment. The line cut swift figures across the surface of the water, like an ice skater in motion. And once again, the trout broke water, throwing spray into the sunlight. Pretty fair brown, the fisherman said. It's enormous. Uh, not for a brown trout. Get them anywhere up to 12 pounds in the brule. When the fish began to tire, the fisherman pointed to his long-handled net lying on the bar. Want to slip it under him, son? Oh, but I might lose him. Wouldn't matter much. Lots more where he come from. I had used the landing net often, and I knew that one must be careful not to scare the fish. The technique is to slip the net very gently behind and below him, and bring it forward and upward with a swift, smooth movement. But Rascal knew none of these subtleties. In his eagerness, he paced the beach, and when the trout showed his back above the water, Rascal pounced. This sent the fish surging to the bottom of the pool. I gave Rascal a, a light snap on the nose, which sent him whimpering up a little tree, talking and scolding about the injustice of it all. Instead of being angry, the fisherman began laughing until he had to take his pipe from his mouth. It might have cost you your trout, I said apologetically. What's one trout, more or less? Well, this one's a beauty, I said, as I brought the net under him. I'll bet he weighs almost three pounds. Well, would you like him, Sonny? I couldn't take your best fish. Best fish? The big man started laughing again. You and your coon come up to the cabin. I'll show you a real trout. As we went in through the big plank door of the cabin, I again had the weird feeling that I knew this place. The great room with its granite fireplace, the shelves of books, the bearskin rug. If I hadn't lived there, and of course I hadn't, I must have dreamed it in detail. Bert Bruce, for that was his name, wanted to show me the 11 pound trout mounted above the mantel so realistically that it seemed alive rising to the brilliant royal coachman, the very fly which had been his undoing. When I held Rascal up to see this magnificent brown trout, he reached for the splash of crimson, which had also lured the fish. My raccoon was proving much too interested in trout flies. What struck me immediately about this cabin was its air of livability. The great pine logs, some of them 40 feet in length, had been peeled and varnished. The pegged plank floor was of white oak, easy to clean. Comfortable chairs, a long table beneath windows overlooking the river, gasoline lamps, everything perfect for an evening of reading beside a birchwood fire. Mr. Bruce hung his fly-decorated hat on a peg, well above the above the reach of Rascal. And while my raccoon investigated at floor level, showed me his cabinet of flies. I had never seen anything like it. Jars of preserved insects netted from this valley, filled an entire shelf. These were the models for the artificial flies which the angler tied himself. The small drawers contained the many materials used to make the flies, might have been those of a jeweler. Within each drawer he kept a separate treasure, well protected from the moths with balls of camphor. The hackles for his flies were largely from game cocks, red, ginger, and grizzled. These he imported from England. 
He trapped his own red foxes and rabbits to make from their underfur the thoraxes, or bodies of his flies, which were firmly banded to the hook with gold or silver wire as fine as a cobweb. The tails of the flies were the slenderest of feather barbs, and the wings were usually small feathers from a starling. Then, with slight hesitation, he showed me the contents of the only drawer which was locked. I immediately realized it contained feathers of a wood duck. I've only shot one in my life, he said. I need these feathers. Can't tie some flies without them. There they lay, gleaming and radiant, the plumage of the most beautiful bird in North America. While I was learning about the art of tying flies, Rascal had found the bearskin rug. The head was mounted with the ferocious mouth wide open, and Rascal was sidelining up, as cautious as a cat, ready at any moment to leap back if the rug attacked him. I twitched the rug, the rug just once, and Rascal nearly fell over backward. But his curiosity outweighed his caution, and he soon returned, touched the bear's nose, running sensitive fingers over the fierce glass eyes, convinced at last that the bear was not alive. He climbed aboard the massive head, proud to have won such a dangerous battle. Soon he was curled in a comfortable position on the skin of this great cousin. In another moment, he was asleep. Do you live here all alone, Mr. Bruce? Call me Bert, my host said. Everyone else does. Yes, I live alone. Can't stand women folks around, cranky clean. Oh, that's the way I feel, I said. Now you take my older sister. I live with her winters, and I like her. But when she comes up here, she dusts and scrubs and changes curtains and moves furniture. Can't lay a book down on the table. She puts it right back on the shelf. Well, I wish I had a cabin like this, I said. Well, son, Bert said, you can't get anything in this world without working for it. I ran a sporting goods store in Chicago for 30 years, sold out and retired. I come up here from early May to late October but I had to earn the money first. I'd work all my life for a cabin like this, I said wistfully. How about a ham sandwich for you and your coon? That would suit us just fine. Well, come along to the ice house and we'll cut a big slice of ham. I took Rascal with us to be sure he wouldn't get into mischief. And while we were in the ice house, Bert had a good idea. He wanted to see how much Rascal weighed. Taking his trout cr creel, he hung it from a scale permanently attached to one of the beams. Discounting the weight of the creel, he now lifted the amiable little raccoon into the wicker basket. Rascal weighed exactly four pounds and three ounces. How old is he, Bert asked. Uh, just about four months, I think. Coming along fine, Bert said relighting his pipe, gaining just about a pound a month. He'll be a big husky fellow before he goes to sleep for the winter. There wasn't any doubt about it. Bert Bruce was our friend. It seemed scarcely possible that two weeks had fled so swiftly. But one afternoon, my father returned to tell me that the court case had been settled and that the following day would be our last on the brule. For the first time since we had come to the Northwoods, I lay awake for a while that evening, listening to the soughing of the wind high in the pines, realizing sadly that we must now return to civilization. I went to sleep with the happier thought that we still had one precious day, and I was determined to make the most of it. Next morning, we took our fishing poles and started downstream to Bert's cabin. It was cool enough to make us grateful for our sweaters. The grass and low bushes in the little clearings were hung with spider webs, 
seeding with pearls of dew, and a few birches were exchanging their summer green for the pale gold of early autumn. My father and Bert had become good friends. On several evenings they had talked about Indians, a mutual passion. The Winnebago's, the Chippewas, the Crees, and the Teton Sioux, and many others, while Rascal and I lay on the bearskin rug. Indians swirled noiselessly around us through the flickering firelight, dancing their war dances, hunting and fishing, moving forlornly to their reservations. For our pleasure on this final day, Bert had offered us the use of his canoe, and we were eager to try it. The brule is mostly navigable by light craft from this cabin down to Lake Superior, and there are several excellent trout pools on these lower reaches, almost certain to produce big fish. Bert saw us safely afloat, bid us farewell and good luck, and waved from his gravel bar. We rounded a bend in the rapids below his pool and cascaded through a tunnel of evergreens. My father was at the stern, and I in the forward seat. Rascal was convinced that he was the pilot. He stood at the prow, peering downstream as might an animated figurehead, sniffing the breeze, watching the river, and occasionally turning to give us brief instructions. As always, he loved speed and a slight sense of danger, cheering with the most satisfaction when we were running whitewater. My father had purchased his first canoe nearly half a century before from a Winnebago Indian. He was excellent, guiding us with swift strokes or the rudder-like action of the trailing paddle. I was also a competent performer, but less adept to the stern than near the prow. The canoe itself was as safe as a rowboat, four feet shorter than the one I was building and twice as wide. It was a handsome craft, riding the water like a swan, and taking us lightly over the shallows where trout lay on the clean gravel, nosing upward against the current. They were almost as invisible as a woodcock among brown leaves. There were very few good fishing place there were very few good fishing places along the first quarter mile below Bert's pool and I did not put aside my paddle to take my rod until we had passed the second bend. Here we found water so peaceful that we could cast our bucktail flies at leisure while letting the canoe drift slowly with the current. A noisy kingfisher disrupted our right to his domain, darting angrily across our path, his crest as erect as the war bonnet of an Indian. For perhaps thirty seconds, a mink watched us from a sandbar, appearing from the underbrush and disappearing again so quickly that we might have doubted our senses had not all three of us seen him clearly. My father hooked a small trout, but returned it to the stream. As we left the pool, we again took our paddles to dart precipitously down another chute. Guiding this craft among the boulders, I thought happily of my own canoe at home, which some day would be ready for the water. My raccoon and I would be afloat every possible moment. About a mile below Bert's cabin, Rascal's sensitive nose caught a scent that spelled danger, and he trilled a warning. Just then my father and I saw a blueberry patch that looked as though it had been hit by a small cyclone. A little farther down the stream, a hollow tree had been ripped open as though by lightning, with shreds of bark and rotten wood and dark honeycomb strewn over a gravel bar. There could be no doubt about it, this was the work of a bear. Talking softly now, and paddling quietly, we progressed cautiously over tranquil water around a wide bend in the stream. And there they were at the foot of the pool a mother black bear and her two cubs. She had just tossed a big trout to her offspring from the rapids below this pool, and the cubs were fighting over the fish, snarling and snapping. Rascal's high trill diverted her from her fishing 
and with a deep-throated growl, she stood her ground for a few moments, eyeing us angrily. Rascal didn't need to be cautioned against swimming to meet these big, rough cousins of his. He stood transfixed at the prow, fascinated but trembling. The bear spoke sharply to her cubs and plunged into the willows and aspens with a great crackling of brush, and her obedient young raced after her. They disappeared as completely as the mink, and soon there was silence. Well, Sterling, you've seen your first bears, and my first deer, and my first porcupine. Nothing could top this experience, I thought, but at the next trout pool, there was one to match it. I overcast the pool into the rapids below and was retrieving my bucktail in an erratic manner to avoid a snag when a smashing strike bent my pole as though it were of willow. My line was taut and the fish had hooked himself solidly on the wet fly and seemed inclined to take it all the way down river to Lake Superior. My father back, backed water to hold the canoe steady against the slight current running through the pool, and I did my best to keep the trout from tangling the line in the half-submerged log in the rapids. Other fish can fight, but there is nothing quite like a big trout for style and grace and courage, as though they drew strength from the whole wilderness. Rascal was excited as I, chattering and churring. Changing tactics, the fish made a dash upstream into our pool. I reeled in slack line as rapidly as possible to keep the needed tension on the hook. For one dreadful moment, I thought I had lost him, but a few more twists of the reel showed me that the trout was still solidly hooked, deep in the brule. In another few moments, he surfaced, saw the canoe, and started a wide circling run upstream. My father swung the prow 180 degrees to give me the best chance to play my fish, which now broke water in a great gleaming leap. Rascal's high trill was like a cheer of praise. When at last my father slipped the net under my fish and brought him into the canoe, I found that I had a fine brown trout, one of the largest I would ever catch in a lifetime of fishing. By the scales in my tackle box, he weighed just over four pounds. He's as big as you are, rascal, I said with delight. He's a beauty, Sterling. Shall I try for more? If you like. But as I put my fish on wet ferns in my creel, I decided I would leave all the other trout in the stream for that day. With Paul still beating a tattoo, I took my paddle and we began the tough return journey against the current. Somewhere it must all be recorded, as insects are captured in amber, that day on the river, transcribed in brule water, written on the autumn air, safe at least in my memory. This was the best trout I had ever eaten. It made a feast that evening for the three of us. But soon after dousing our campfire, a wind arose, roaring through the pines and driving the cold rain like sleet through the dripping forest. We hastily packed everything in the car, put up the side curtains, and spent an uncomfortable night huddled on the seats of the Oldsmobile. Next day, we started home through air, through air wash clean by the storm. We were tired and damp, but replenished by the two weeks among the pines of our magnificent North Country.